Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. Today we're devoting our show to talking about heritage language, what it is, and how it gets lost. What efforts are St. Louis area folks making to teach kids their heritage language? And why is it that linguistic connection is about so much more than words, be they spoken, read, or written? Children of immigrants often lose their elders' native language. It's a common side effect of immigration, but it's not inevitable. Our production intern, Aula Kuziz, was raised speaking Arabic. When she moved to the United States from Syria 12 years ago, at age 9, she nearly lost her Arabic fluency as she learned to speak English. She now makes a concerted effort to ensure kids in her community don't lose out on a connection to their heritage. Here's Aula. When people find out that English is my second language, they marvel that I don't have an accent. I'm told that for an immigrant, my English is flawless. At first, I took these comments as compliments. After all, it was a big accomplishment to learn a whole new language and speak it fluently in just a few years' time. But I see it differently now. My perfect English nearly came at the cost of losing my first language. In elementary and middle school, I started to let go of Arabic so that I could focus on learning English. My mom would ask me something in Arabic, I would answer in English. I spoke, read, and thought in my new language, internalizing the notion that this was the right thing to do. I lost some Arabic vocabulary. I no longer used or understood common idioms and expressions and English quickly became my preferred language. As immigrants attempt to settle into their new country, they often experience an intense pressure to fit in. Family members often encourage assimilation in hopes of protecting them from prejudice. Yet, even when immigrants are encouraged to celebrate their culture, like my ESL teacher did with me, language loss remains common. Research shows that the heritage language of today's immigrants will live into the second generation, but will fade and expire by the fourth. But heritage languages are not necessarily doomed to die out. Many parents and community members in the St. Louis area make a concerted effort to teach their children the languages used by their families growing up. In some cases, they're also teaching themselves in the hopes that it lives on and gets passed down to future generations. Ten-year-old Maria and her younger brother, Fadis, are at my house in West County for their weekly Arabic lesson. Assalamu alaikum, Marla. What are we going to do today? Today, we're using food to learn. We have in front of us olives, khubiz, and olive oil. We take turns speaking. How do we say, I want more bread? Anna, bidi, bread. Oh, I forgot that Can word. I correct? Yes, yes, help him out. Please help. Mm. Oh. Kamal. That's right, Anna all right. Bidi. Kamal Khubiz. The Arabic alphabet has unique sounds that are not part of the English language. Getting the pronunciation right is challenging at first. Fadis and Madia practice reciting a verse from the Quran. It's also hard to read Arabic words, which run from right to left. But Madia and Fadis are getting better and faster at putting together the letters to correctly pronounce words. Is it a ha? That's right. Okay. Their mom, Nawal Abu Hamde, says that as a young kid, she lost most of her Arabic. That's one of the main reasons she wants her children to learn the language. Honestly, I wish I knew it better, but the situation is that I'm the youngest of six in my family. And so I think that when it came down to me, um, all my siblings were speaking English in the house. Uh, And then not only that, you know, I learned it in school. I learned English in school. That's how we communicate with our peers and our friends. And so uh, I don't know it. 
And it hurts me. I really wish I knew Arabic and I really want my children to learn it. Nawal went through an experience common among many children of immigrants, a confusion of cultural identity that had a lasting impact. Growing up, I was always confused. Sometimes they said I was a Palestinian, but then you're also American. And so don't let anyone tell you you're not Palestinian, but don't let anyone tell you you're not American either. So it was always so very confusing to me. And then... um, Also, I do remember my dad only speaking English with us because he wanted us to learn English. Um, And I I think they just didn't really know how to navigate, you know, in America, but also keeping the identity. Now, as a parent, she says it's important that her kids don't experience the language loss she went through. She wants them to learn Arabic for two main reasons— First, she says it'll give them a strong foundation for reading and understanding the Qur'an, Islam's holy book which is written in Arabic. The language is also of cultural significance for Nawal and her family. We're Palestinian, and that's a huge identity in us, um, Muslim Palestinian Americans. And so um, Arabic is the native language of Palestine and Palestinians, and I do hope that we will go back, and when we do go back, they will be able to conversate with our neighbors and their cousins and my family. Maria also dreams of visiting her family in Palestine and speaking fluently with them. I I really want to go. Um, I hope to go one day. Um, but when I do go, they're probably going to be only speaking Arabic. They're probably like trying to talk to me in Arabi. The shop people will talk to me in Arabi if I go to any shops. And I want to learn to speak Arabi so that I can communicate with them in Arabi in my language. When she's around people who are speaking Arabic, she says she doesn't like that she's not able to understand or contribute to the conversation. A lot of People in my family speak it, and I don't understand what they're saying, and I just, I don't like it when I don't understand what they're saying. With each language lesson, that feeling fades. Maria enjoys being able to show her grandma her new skills. She gets um, happy with me. She, um, she, like, sometimes claps for me, and... When I tell her I learned something new in Quran class, she says, good job, and she um, tells me to explain it to her and all that stuff. Knowing something new makes me feel excited and hopeful that I'll be able to learn more. I see myself in Maria and Fadis. When my family first moved to St. Louis from Syria, my grandma was heartbroken to see her children converse in English only. It became hard to connect with her, and she felt she was losing a part of us. That was my motivation to reconnect with Arabic. I started speaking it again at home, practicing the language with family and friends, and soon enough, I regained my fluency. Letting go of your family's first language means losing a part of yourself. I almost missed out on speaking and reading Arabic, and I'm grateful to my parents and family who were patient in encouraging me to use it and to be proud of it. In complex situations, I still feel most comfortable using English. Other times, I rely on Arabic words and expressions to convey the full meaning and depth of a moment. Like when I want to tell my nephews I love them, I say, Inte ruhi, inte albi, inte hayati, meaning, You are my soul, you are my heart, you are my life. A language is more than just a way to communicate. It's an intrinsic part of cultural expression. Now, when I converse in Arabic with my grandma, I feel a strong bond with her and with our heritage. Arabic is a treasure to me, and I wish that kind of connection for many generations of Arabic speakers to come.
That was St. Louis on the Air production intern Aula Kuziz describing her experiences around almost losing her heritage language, then regaining it, and how she's helping children in her community learn and embrace Arabic too. And we are highlighting your experiences this hour. Albina arrived to the United States from Bosnia when she was 12 years old. I was speaking English most of the day while I was going to middle school, high school, and college. And then as I was growing in my profession, I spoke a lot of English throughout the day. So it was much easier to speak English when I came home. But what I see with other mothers who came to the United States when they were a little bit older, uh, maybe after high school or after university, they seem to be speaking in, uh, Bosnian more in their homes with their children. Um, the way I am coping with this is um, I try to visit my home country uh, every summer so that the children can speak um, and, and catch more, more of the Bosnian language. And I also uh, have a class that they attend once a week on Sunday morning where they learn. And I try to get them to spend a lot of time with grandparents on a regular basis so that they can learn. And um, we also do like story time as a family um, where we read books in Bosnian. We also heard from Sausan, a Syrian St. Louis resident who says she's motivated to work with children, especially refugee children, in order to help them maintain connections to their faith and cultural background. I teach Arab refugee kids Arabic language lessons to make sure they don't lose their language. I also teach them so they stay connected to their religion and culture as they grow up in America. Since many of their parents are very busy and don't have the time to teach their kids Arabic, I took this task upon myself in order to preserve their language, religion, and culture. Do you speak your parents' or grandparents' language? How are you passing down your native tongue to your children? Is your heritage language something you're currently trying to learn? Let us know what it's been like and why language is important to you. Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK. You can also email us at talk at stlpr.org or send us a note via social at STL on Air or on our St. Louis on the Air Facebook page. Page. Now, joining us to discuss heritage language, both from the perspective of a scholar who studies it and as a person who speaks one, we have Ander Berestein, Assistant Professor of Spanish and Linguistics at St. Louis University. Ander, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited to talk about this uh, important topic mm-hmm. today. Now, we've just heard Aula's piece. Can you give us sort of a formal definition of what heritage language is, and then perhaps how Aula's work illuminates or illustrates things that can be hard to describe with a definition? Aula's work, I was listening to it so attentively, and she hit on so many important spots, like with the Uh, kids' testimonials, her own experience, those mothers' uh, words as well. All of these people think that the heritage language experience is so unique, but at the end of the day, there is a pattern, as with many things. So the official definition, I shouldn't say official, because depending on the type of scholar that you are or the type of perspective that you bring, you know, because you can analyze language, language being such an interdisciplinary field, you can observe it through social meaning through cognitive meaning so psychological meaning you know so in my case at least working from a um, multilingual perspective the definition that we generally use for heritage languages is somebody that and i'm gonna put it on lay english here somebody that might have started but they start learning their heritage language you know in their house in their family through heritage. So they have a cultural connection, they have a familial connection to this language. But then somehow, uh, at some point of their life, there is a discontinuity, there is an interruption. Mm -hmm. And that discontinuity or that interruption can be in Ula's case, for instance, when she moved from Syria to the US. For some other kids, it doesn't necessarily need to be a move 
uh, that is that big. It can be you can be a kid in the United States that has been speaking Arabic in in the house, but then suddenly you get to middle school and there's no more Arabic. So now there is an interruption. So now suddenly you're gonna switch to English, and Arabic is gonna be used only in the household. So that mm-hmm. is a serious interruption, right? Right, right? So that is the definition that we use for a heritage language. In a way, it's a language that you started learning through heritage. It usually is the first one that you acquire, but then at some point in life, there is that interruption, that discontinuity, and there is a switch in the language that you start using, in the language that you, the dominant you in a way we in linguistics we use these terms of weak language and strong language or dominant language and weak language so mm-hmm. your dominant language suddenly becomes weak for societal reasons and those societal reasons are just that your heritage language is not so used in 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 society right in and the u.s the case the case is usually english mm-hmm. and for you yourself you are a, a speaker of a particular dialect of Spanish, correct? Actually, that is, um, I'm glad you're saying that because many people think that the Basque language uh, is a part of Spanish just Mm. because it is spoken in Spain, but it actually is a completely different language. It just is a minoritized language in Spain. Uh, So people just assume that it, it, it is a smaller version or a dialect, as you say, of Spanish, but it actually is a completely different language. Mm-hmm. It's its own it just, thing. Yes, it's, it actually is what we call in linguistics a language isolate, which mm-hmm. means that there's no other language that has been found to be related to it. So it makes it even more unique in that sense. Right. And I would imagine maybe harder to pass along. Yes. yes. So as you might imagine, in the Basque country, you're fine because many people use it, even if it's a minoritized language, uh, th- there are certain areas where it is used. But then if you happen to be somebody like me that then moves to the United States, th- your communities become really small. Like right. the, the amount of people that I can use Basque with is reduces significantly in this country. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back very shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. Let's return to our conversation about heritage language and how it's lost and found. Before the break, we were talking with SLU Spanish and linguistics professor Andrew Berestein about the definition of heritage language. And we're hearing from you this hour. Namrata is a first-generation American who is involved in Hindi USA St. Louis. Here's what she shared with us. My mother tongue is Hindi. I have two daughters. My husband and I have been trying to teach them Hindi, and Hindi USA has been a great resource in that. I believe that language is an integral part of a culture, and if you want to understand it better, you should know the language. I would love my kids to know this, their Indian roots and feel to be a part of it. It is also very important for me that my kids have a good bonding with their grandparents, and speaking the same language is key to it. Another reason for my desire for my kids to know Hindi is that even though I have been speaking English for such a long time, I think that I can express my feelings better in Hindi and I would love if my kids can understand that and reciprocate and always be connected to me. Do you speak your parents' or grandparents' language? How are you a parent or are you a parent passing down your native tongue to your children? Let us know what that's been like and why language is so important to you. Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 314-382-TALK. You can also email us at talk at stlpr.org or send us a note via social at STL on air or on our St. Louis on the Air Facebook page. I'd like to take this time to introduce another 
guest uh, in studio, guest to the conversation, someone who's actively engaged in ensuring in ensuring that St. Louisans can access education in Hindi. Mayank Jain is the coordinator of Hindi USA St. Louis, the largest nonprofit Hindi language school in the Midwest. Mayank, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So the school that you coordinate now, it started with you and an idea in mm-hmm. 2017. What sparked that idea, Mayank? In other words, what need were you trying to fill? Absolutely. So first of all, thanks for having me here. And I started teaching to my son Hindi language. I myself am an immigrant from India. And uh, when I started teaching my son, he was about five or four or five year old. And after teaching for about two years, I started looking out for any school. And I did not have any school, or I did not find any school that teaches Hindi in a systematic manner. So just like how one can make, you know, a good coach can make Mahomes that can play a <laughs> good football, but Mahomes need a team to play with. Right, right, right. So I started looking for a team. And when I did not find somebody who my son could speak with or have an environment, me and my wife, Dr. Anshu Jain, we started this organization called Learn Hindi STL mm. in a public library. That's That was the idea. And we wanted to make sure that our son, just like other speakers have mentioned, know the their heritage language. They they can connect with grandparents, and connect with and understand the great you know culture uh, that you know India has to offer. Mm-hmm. Now you started that small at a public library, and people responded. They responded so well, in fact, that. Uh, within a couple of years, Hindi USA, which is national in scope, invited you to join as a member. And today, mm-hmm. as we noted, your school is the biggest nonprofit Hindi language school in the Midwest. That's that's quite something. Why do you think it's done so well? I mean, was it something about your approach to to teaching? You'd mentioned you needed something that was a little more mm-hmm. systematic. Um, was it that as well as some some cultural elements that you know both students and families seem to appreciate? Absolutely. So one of the thing is people, mostly people who immigrated from India, they had a need. All I did was you know amplified that need and help them you know have a common purpose and common cause because all of them were teaching Hindi in some way or other. So all I, me and my you know, wife and all the volunteers did was connect them to the roots. So that was one. Second is we uh, we invited people to join us as volunteers. And being in America, you know, it's, it's a great place to live, great place which encourages the the giving back to the community. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I learned coming here. People started joining. Uh, we had a great curriculum that we adopted gradually from Hindi USA, and yes, definitely uh, lots of volunteers who joined with us, they teach, and yeah, all things came together with the right direction, and it helped. And we, in addition, we also organized multiple events, Mm -hmm. and many parents would like their kids to be a part of a community, part of, you know, a a cultural event, for example, Diwali or, or, you know, Hindi poetry competition and stuff like that. So. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you're hearing uh, Mayank speak about community, can you talk about how that is important to retention of heritage language? Of Absolutely. course. I, mm-hmm. I also I also want to say that Mayank and I have a mm-hmm. mutual connection. One of my colleagues is uh, San actually attends your school. So oh, when okay. we found out that we were both going to be interviewed at the same time, I said, oh, nice. I have to say hi to him. <laughs> yes. Um, um, yes. So, you know, I think the community aspect is so important because, as I said before, that when that interruption happens in the heritage language acquisition process, many times that language becomes isolating. You know, it's a language that's spoken in the household mm-hmm. and not really outside of the house. So making the language a part of your daily life, making it natural, making it, you know, I hate the word normal, but just make it make it not that I don't know, like that, that, that it's mm-hmm. just like something that happens in very specific moments and make and, and having the community use it 
and and the, because the more people that use it the easier it's going to be to retain it as you were saying so that's right, that's right. that's really important so there are other aspects that i just wanted to highlight uh, is as nelson mandela said once you know he if you speak to someone who understands the language you are talking to his head mm. Mm -hmm. But if you just but if you speak to somebody in his own language, right, you are talking to his heart, mm -hmm. right, yeah. and that's the connection. That's the uh, philosophy of you know why many parents choose to teach the language. But in order to take it to next level, in terms of passing it to the next generation, I think it takes a village, as they say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to have encouragement reward mechanism scholarships at right from starting from home to mm -hmm. you know some kind of reward system at home to to the school level at the county level at the state level and then the national level mm -hmm. at all level i think there is a need to encourage the language by school systems as well as mm -hmm. a, like maybe included as a part of world language maybe have a mm -hmm. language day maybe have you know some type of mechanism which can eventually lead to employment mm -hmm. because unless it is tied to employment it's very difficult to sustain the language it can be hard right now under in your research um, and in your experience as well have you observed that there is a greater interest in language learning more recently um, whether it's in efforts you know that are similar to what Mayank has described or you know and, and in particular to uh, it, thinking about it in the context of the Midwest, mm -hmm. is there is there well, more interest? I don't know if it specifically is more interest at this for a specific reason right now. But what I will say is that nowadays we live in a more multicultural and multilingual and and just more connected world where you know that if you speak more languages, you're gonna be able to access other communities hearts as uh, the other speaker was saying right so the more languages you speak the more successful you will be able to be so and i think that's something that uh, a lot of language departments at universities and schools use you know as a marketing strategy and and i mean it is a marketing strategy but it is very valid you know because the more languages you speak the more people you'll be able Absolutely. to talk to mm -hmm. so that's 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 a great selling point and i think something that the U.S., because of different historical reasons, has been a little slower in that trend. You know, I'm, I come mm -hmm. from Europe, where we have so many uh, languages. We have a link, almost a language per per country, and they're official, most of them, in at the European Union level. But even the U.S., there's not even an official language. Like nobody, not many people know that. But right, English right. is not English is not actually the official language in the U.S. Nor is Spanish, nor is any other language. So mm -hmm. it's. Yep. It, it you have to make it official as 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 he was saying and implement it in different settings so that then people can keep using it. Mm -hmm. yep. I totally contexts. agree with that as well. Uh, while we talk about Europe, I can definitely relate that with India as well, where almost all states have their own either a you know state level language or a mm -hmm. dialect. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Uh, and when it comes to Midwest, coming back to your point, I feel Midwest is definitely an area where many parents, you know, find uh, their kids to grow. I mean, they, they find it, uh, uh, you know, very encouraging. And uh, they can also look forward to uh, something called seal of biliteracy, which is across mm -hmm. the nation. But for mm -hmm. the most part, mm -hmm. many schools are off, you know, encouraging kids to take seal of biliteracy and... Uh, Mm -hmm. So it's maybe not just a specific to Midwest, but definitely there's a lot of interest now happening. I've been to Chicago, I've been to, and I know, in Indianapolis and other places where there's a lot of people right, learning the languages. Right. People everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to take a quick break, but we will come back to this conversation about heritage language, losing it, regaining, teaching it to successive generations, to, to kids in particular. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, 
committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome back. Today we've been discussing heritage language and how it can be both lost and found by generations of Americans whose elders came to the U.S. from countries with languages other than English as the dominant language. And with us in studio, we have Mayank Jain, who is the coordinator of Hindi USA St. Louis, and Ander Berestein, who is assistant professor of Spanish and linguistics at St. Louis University. Ander, let's get to this question uh, around assimilation. How is it that assimilation and sociopolitical factors, uh, how do they affect language loss and retention? Well, it's that's, that's a very complex question that uh, cannot be answered in five minutes, but mm-hmm. if I have to give you a, 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 a short answer for that is just think of what it entails for these people to go. If we're talking about immigrants, which is many times how this heritage language acquisition process starts when they come from their countries. Um, think of what is involved there. Like there can be a lot of trauma involved there. You don't know why they're moving. You don't know why they're, they've decided to change countries. And then get into a new country and and being affected by how people are looking at you, talking to you, treating you, you know, that can have two very different reactions. We can have the those people that decide to completely assimilate to the culture, meaning linguistic loss, because um, they don't want their kids to go through what they went through. And that's a valid reason for them. If they've if they've struggled, they don't want their kids to 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 do struggle as well then let's just switch to English and make it easy for the kids, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the other the other uh, reaction that we can have is what, for instance, your intern Ula was saying when she realized that she was on the verge of losing uh, Arabic because she felt that she wasn't fluent, that she wasn't understanding or were not. Um, you have this internal desire, this motivation to bring it back to your life, right? Mm-hmm. So um, some people are take a lot of pride in their language and they keep it, right? As uh, Mayank was saying, he was using Hindi with his kid. And that means that he, he's proud of his language and he was willing to use it, but many other immigrants don't have the same experience. So I think we have to look at this from like very different perspectives when we consider how language loss or assimilation might happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I think language is fundamentally the the you know aspect of a cultural identity wherein mm-hmm. there are other aspects in terms of like language uh, it promotes communication it promotes the unity uh, it has the aspect of political expression a language is a medium for political expression and ac- activism uh, you know language can reflect the the power dynamics it it can affect the international relations there are a lot of different aspects when it comes to a language. And U.S. in a recent survey is, is you know, most of the people speak a single language and, and kids learn second language, but then they may not retain it through the years. Right. So, um, and most of the other nations, if you look at maybe Europe or even Asia Pacific, they generally know English and they know their own language. Mm-hmm. So, it is very important for U.S. and then you know people in general here to to have ability to understand the language and we have that you know connection with the rest of the world. Uh, and I feel it has a lot of uh, impact in terms of even legislation and governance in terms of languages used in laws, policies, official documents. Uh, recently, there have been you know publications and I have come across people who are doing some kind of you know, uh, translation of, uh, say, voting instructions and all that in, right, a, in, right. a, in a Hindi language. And I saw somebody doing that translation. So there's a lot of connection that one can build in terms of social and political as- landscape using languages. Right. And it, so it is not mm. merely um, the conversation you have with a, an elder at the table. There's much more involved as well. Absolutely. Now, one of the things, you know, I, I was born in Canada 
I spoke only Korean when I entered kindergarten mm-hmm. because, as you said, Ander, I grew up in uh, a situation where the, that private language at home was Korean, mm-hmm. and I'm the oldest child as well. And then when I tried to go to Korean school, when I was uh, like 12, I was put into mm-hmm. a class with much younger kids. That was mm-hmm. not fun. So mm-hmm. I dropped out. Mm-hmm. Now, shame is a common feeling, I think, for people of many different ages trying to learn something for the first mm-hmm. time. You know, how is it that shame affects language learning, Ander? Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, it affects it in an incredible way. And I want to bring back a point that my young uh, mentioned earlier, this kind of reward system, because, of course, we're not going to reward a person but for speaking their heritage language every single time they use a heritage language, because then we're not making the use of the language naturalistic. And then we lose that sense of, you know, you see, like in an everyday context. But um this goes back to like every single time a heritage speaker tries to use their not every single time but most of the times that they try to use a heritage language the way that their heritage language has developed is not the same way that uh in your case for instance i'll use your example if you have a kid that lives in korea and only uses korean in their daily life the way that the language is going to develop in those kids brains is very different from what happened to Mm -hmm. you in the context of canada because you had other languages around you then as soon as you got out of the house you had a different language to be spoken so the way that your language skills and those kids in korea um, might develop them are very different. But then what, what what we have to look at here is what are the teachers doing at school? You know, mm-hmm. because many times teachers are not well versed in what heritage learning and pedagogy is. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So they might think of kids as monolingual equivalents, you know, and they just have certain expectations that is what they do because they are maybe uh, first language Korean speakers and they expect that the uh, heritage speakers might speak like they do. Mm-hmm. And that's not how heritage language development works. Right. So yeah. it's very important. It's very important to train teachers or at least inform them about uh, language acquisition, different types of teaching methods, what works for these type of populations, because what works for the ordinary, um, you know, first language English speaker that starts learning Spanish in middle or high school is not the same thing that the kid that has uh, lived in Caesar or Chicago for their uh, life has been speaking Spanish to all their family. But then when they go to high school somewhere else in Chicago, they don't have that much exposure. So those kids have Spanish within them, but the development is very different. Mm So many kids, many teachers don't know this. And then they treat those kids as if they were from Mexico and they expect their Spanish level to be like a person from Mexico. And that's not a realistic expectation to have. And we know that when you set unrealistic goals, frustration goes both ways. The teacher will be frustrated because, (laughs) well, this kid, this kid is not doing what I'm expecting them to do. And then the kid by themselves, they're feeling horrible because maybe they want to connect back to their, to their culture, to their language. And they can't feel like they can do that because their teacher is strict. And I'm not blaming all on the teachers. You know, I'm a teacher and uh, we all make mistakes sometimes, but speci- specifically in those those people that are not trained or are not used to dealing with heritage languages, that can be very um, punishing for um, the uh, students going through that system because then what that's going to do is they're going to feel so bad that they you don't know, they might end up hating the language and everything related to the language and yes. they might give up on it. Uh, you know, like happens. you don't know. Mm-hmm. You don't now, Jenny is in her fourth year with Hindi USA St. Louis. She decided to learn Hindi because it was part of her parents' childhood. And Jenny feels a sense of pride in her heritage when she engages in Hindi. Learning Hindi has opened up a lot of opportunities to appreciate the literature, as I'm able to read and write and also understand and enjoy Bollywood movies and songs with my family. Sometimes I find it challenging to be comfortable and talk like a native Hindi speaker with the right accent, but it is a challenge I'd like to work on and overcome with time. One of the main benefits of learning Hindi is that I'm able to appreciate something so integral to my culture and roots, and it also helps me to identify myself to who I truly am a mix of both past and present. I hope to keep learning and loving the language and hopefully also inspire the future generations to continue to appreciate it. So, Mayank, Jenny, she Mm -hmm. talked about feeling proud learning Hindi. 
So she seems to have her own sort of internal motivation. Is that something that you see with a lot of the students that you've worked with, that it's not coming from parental Mm -hmm. force, Mm -hmm. but it is something that they want for themselves? There are, I would say, Mm 50-50 or maybe even less. Uh, But yes, initially the kids are brought by the parents and but there are a lot of other kids who do share the same bond and then you know a sense of pride uh, learning the language mm-hmm. so there are kids like those yeah and under in our final minute what is uh, maybe one tip or two tips for parents or teachers who are working to teach their kids or maybe themselves their heritage language yeah and this is a great connection with what my young just said i would say don't force the language because like if you force your kid to speak the language and when they don't really feel it or feel like it that's not going to end up well because they're going to have a certain reaction to the use of language so i think the tip is to make it uh, uh make the language a part of the daily life make language. it use creative yeah learning. like Exactly. So you put it like you have it with the community, you make them use it in different contexts. But Ula was saying with the with the students that come to learn Arabic to their house, that was great, you know, like make them learn language in the daily context. Like what is what what are we going to eat? Let's cook. Let's mm-hmm. use the language while we could you while we cook, you know, so those type of things are what we need to um, keep doing and certainly having teachers that um, understand that what heritage learners do or go through is not the same as the ordinary second language learner of of certain language. Andre Berestein is Assistant Professor of Spanish and Linguistics at St. Louis University, and Mayank Jain is the coordinator of Hindi USA St. Louis, the largest nonprofit Hindi language school in the Midwest. Today's segment was produced by Aula Kuziz. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.